two of The Science of Can and Can't by Chiara Maletto, or rather, my commentary on The Science of Can and Can't by Chiara Maletto. And last time, in the first episode, I gave a broad overview of what The Science of Can and Can't was about and plucked out a few bits and pieces from Chapter 1. It was much broader than what today is going to be about. I'm still on Chapter 1, however, I'm just going to be focusing on the physics content of The Science of Can and Can't Chapter 1. And that Chapter 1 is, of course, such stuff as dreams are made on. And in the previous episode about this book, it was about the some of the ways in which constructor theory might be applied to many different areas of science and why this way of conceiving of science as being about what could possibly occur and what could not possibly occur is a new mode of explanation that might have useful applications not only to things like science and biology, but even to aspects of our knowledge like art and literature. But today, really, the focus is going to be on the physics. So I'm just going to dive straight into the book partway through um, the chapter. And Chiara writes, quote, A boundary has been generated that affects and constrains the way criticism and conjecture can occur, a boundary that is keeping out certain kinds of explanations from the allowed set. These are explanations that involve counterfactuals. The boundary grew up because of a phenomenon that has been going on for some time, silently, largely unnoticed, like water seeping into a ship whose hull has a hidden hole below the waterline. To see what it is, we must start where it all began. We must start with physics. It is perhaps ironic that this boundary-generating phenomenon started in physics because physics is one of the clearest examples of how thinking can produce knowledge and make rapid progress. At a glance, from what one is taught in elementary courses at school, physics may appear like a collection of tools to solve irrelevant problems of the kind you get in weekly physics tests. What is the time of flight of an apple that falls from a tree of a certain height? How long will it take a bathtub of such a volume to be filled with water if the water is flowing in at this rate, and so on? Compared with other disciplines, such as literature or philosophy, physics may not seem to be about deep things at all. Who cares, after all, about how an apple falls? Isn't that fantastically narrow in scope? This first impression is very far from the truth. Physics is a dazzling firework display. It is profound, beautiful and illuminating, a source of never-ending delight. Physics is about solving problems in our understanding of reality by formulating explanations that fill gaps in our previous understanding. The point of physics is not the particular calculation about the fall of an apple, It is the explanation behind it which unifies all motions, that of the apple with that of a planet in the solar system and beyond. The dazzling stuff consists of explanations for they surprise us by revealing things that were previously unknown and very distant from our intuition with the aim of solving a particular problem. As I said, problems always consist of a contrast or clash between ideas about the world. For example, in the past, people believed that the Earth was at the centre of the universe, but that notion clashed irredeemably with observations, such as those about the apparent movement of the stars, of the other planets, and of the moon. This led Copernicus and Galileo to conjecture that the Sun, not the Earth, was at the centre of the solar system. The Copernican Revolution was an astonishing change of perspective, which allowed us to make formidable progress in understanding astronomy and celestial mechanics, and eventually led, via a series of further steps, to our current space exploration enterprises. Pausing there, my reflection on this. Now, it might be, if you're paying careful attention to some of my podcasts here, it might seem that there is a contradiction in what I say about this kind of thing here. What Chiara refers to as the Copernican Revolution, what historians refer to as the Copernican Revolution, what many people refer to as the Copernican Revolution. But one of the reasons why it's referred to as the Copernican Revolution is because it is supposed to be revolutionary. But I wouldn't take the word revolution too seriously. The sociologist, philosopher of science, scientist and physicist, Thomas Kuhn, wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where he sought to explain that progress in science, 
progress in scare quotes to some extent, was a story of revolutions, the overturning of particular frameworks. And if you were in one framework or paradigm, one way of understanding the world, then it was very difficult for you to understand any other way of conceiving that the world could operate. In other words, science was always a sociological battle, this, this battle between the old fogies and the new upstarts. And there's no real objective way of determining who is correct on this account, but rather it is a political battle between the old and the young lions battling it out and just having arguments that are filled with emotion and filled with politics, rather than objectively looking at the facts and coming to a deeper understanding of the world. The Copernican Revolution, as Chiara says there, is certainly an astonishing change of perspective because we went from conceiving of ourselves as human beings occupying a planet at the center of the universe, every other celestial body orbiting around us. What Copernicus and others saw was that the better explanation, the better scientific explanation, was to shift the Earth from the center to having the sun at the center, heliocentrism. Now, on one hand, this is an, an astonishing change of perspective, certainly mentally for people. However, the scientific theory, the scientific theory that goes on to explain orbital motions of celestial objects didn't change that much because we still had orbits. Things were still moving in approximate circles or ellipses. There was still relative motion between these objects. The difference was an incremental change from having one object at the center to having a different object at the center. On the one hand, the Earth then the sun. Now, we can debate about what it would mean for that to be revolutionary, but the usual understanding of revolution is a complete overturning of everything, but not everything was overturned. And so we could make a pretty strong counter-argument that this wasn't really a revolution. It was a Copernican <laughs> incremental change to the existing understanding of the universe, but it was but it still was an astonishing change of perspective. But scientifically speaking, it allowed us to correct certain errors in the way in which eventually allowed us to correct certain errors in the way in which planetary motions operated. But people who follow in the intellectual tradition of Thomas Kuhn like to make a big deal about changes like this. They formulate an entire view of science, which is there are those who believed in the Copernican idea and those who believe in the Ptolemaic idea. And there was just no way that these two groups of people could communicate with one another. They're operating in completely different paradigms. But were they? Were they really operating in completely different paradigms? After all, the content of both theories remained relatively unchanged. It was just the object at the center was the thing that changed. It was an incremental change, I would suggest, following in Popper's intellectual tradition. If, on the other hand, we had have gone from a Ptolemaic view to a Copernican view, where there were no such things as orbits, there were no such things as planets, there was no relative motion between the celestial objects, if all of it was utterly overturned, then I could get it. Then I could understand that maybe this would be revolutionary. But in fact, so much of the theory was maintained. And this is true between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics as well. And that, that's a bigger change. That's a much bigger change of perspective and much more of the content actually changes as well. But much, much is preserved. And as Chiara says in exactly the same sentence where she says that the Copernican revolution was an astonishing change of perspective, it then led via a series of further steps to our current space exploration enterprises. So it's, it's always this story of steps, these incremental steps. It's very hard to leap to something utterly different where you're just giving up everything that you knew previously and coming up with a theory that, that in no way contains any of the content of the previous theory. It typically does. It typically does. You know, we go from having a force of gravity to no force of gravity. But lots of stuff still remains the same. Mass is still involved, for example. Energy is still involved, for example. Orbits still happen. For example, back to the book, Chiara writes, quote, By solving problems of that kind, physicists have gradually uncovered entirely unsuspected worlds 
telling us a deeper layer of the story of how things are. These layers are beyond the immediate reach of our senses, but our mind can visualise them in the light of explanations. In existing physics, all explanations have some primitive elements, in terms of which the physical reality to be explained is expressed. The appearance of the dark sky at night is a perfect example of that. It can be explained in terms of the unexpected underlying phenomena involving things like photons, the remarkable fact that the universe is expanding, and so on. None of those elements is apparent in the sky itself, but they are all part of the explanation for why it looks the way it does in terms of what is really out there. Explanations are accounts of what is seen in terms of mostly unseen elements. Pausing there, my reflection. So this is a common thread now that runs through the work of Karl Popper, David Deutsch, Chiara Maletto. That we have this conception of science, almost everything, as I like to say, interesting that we know about science is the seen, what we can observe, in terms of the unseen, what we cannot observe. And I've been at pains in my conversations on that other podcast and various other places with Naval Ravikant to explain and try and promote this idea that almost everything in science is not about what we can observe directly. And it is very well encapsulated by this idea of explaining the seen in terms of the unseen. And so if we can go through the standard examples again, David's favorite example being that of dinosaurs, We do not observe dinosaurs. They're unseen. What we observe are fossils in the ground. Those fossils in the ground that that exist in rocks are essentially patterns in rocks that we have to interpret. And then a chain of explanatory interpretations leads us to the conclusion that once upon a time, more than 62 million years ago, walked the earth these huge creatures that we call dinosaurs, that we do not observe. And that unless we build time machines or we have significantly more advanced genetic engineering, we will not see with our eyes. Instead, we must imagine, this is part of the explanatory theory, that explains why fossils exist. The cause of the fossils is these unseen things. And so now we can change that to, I like to use, um, stellar nucleosynthesis, stellar nuclear fusion. We, we cannot travel to the center of a star, to the core of a star like the sun. In fact, there are good physical reasons why it is impossible for us to directly observe anything at the core of the sun. We cannot send a probe there. There is no material that can survive the journey to the center of the sun. We can't even send things to the center of the earth, much less the center of the sun. Any material out of which you think you could make a probe, the most the strongest titanium tungsten alloy isn't going to make it even to the surface of the sun before the thing entirely melts and then vaporizes. We're not going to get to the center of the sun, but we know what's going on there. We cannot see what's going on there directly. All we do is collect photons of light here at Earth and interpret those photons of light. And by a chain of explanation and interpretation, we conclude, oh, there's hydrogen there at the center of the sun. Protons, those protons, those hydrogen nuclei, are being smashed together with sufficient energy that they fuse, forming helium. And that process releases heat and light, and that's what we detect. And the explanation of the light here at Earth is because of that process going on at the core of the sun, which we cannot see. The Big Bang is another fantastic one that we will never see the Big Bang. We cannot be there to observe it. No one was there to observe it. No one ever will be there to observe it. But it happened. So we are explaining what we see now, the cosmic microwave background, the so-called Hubble expansion of the universe, the, 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 the redshift of galaxies, and the ratio of hydrogen to helium, and indeed the dark night sky. All of these things are explained by this unseen thing, the Big Bang. Choose your favorite example from science, from modern science, and you will quickly realize that there is a part of the explanation which relies upon unseen things going on. The problem, of course, is in the seen. We, we end up observing something and we go, we can't explain this observation. What is going on here? The observation causes us to think, well, that doesn't make sense in light of this. So let's try to come up with an explanation. And the explanation falls back towards things that we cannot observe. 
It's a very fascinating part of science. It's a different way of conceiving of science, by the way. Anyone who describes himself as an empiricist would have to explain what's going on here because empiricism is the misconception that science is only about the things that we can observe. That you need to prove uh, the scientific theory by recourse to observations in the world. But that's not the way that science works because, again, the vast majority of interesting stuff in science is about the unseen or the unobserved. Okay, let's go back to the book and Chiara writes, There is no limitation in principle to how deep one can go in finding even more primitive elements. The primitive elements of an explanation can always be explained further in terms of other entities, and so on, going deeper and deeper. Deeper levels of explanation may look very different from the shallower ones. For instance, there was a time in physics when particles were thought to be the ultimate elements of reality. These are discrete lumps of matter interacting with each other via forces at a distance. That view was then overturned by the idea of fields. A field in physics is a thing that, that permeates everything there is in a continuous way. Particles are now understood as excitations, ripples, of fields. But fields themselves could, in principle, be broken down further into more primitive elements of explanation, opening up a novel and even more fundamental explanation of reality. This may be hard to imagine for us, but we must be prepared to imagine more fundamental entities than fields given that physics is open to further, more fundamental explanations. The resulting picture of scientific knowledge is that there are different levels of explanation about reality. Each of these levels may sometimes be autonomous, in the sense that it does not need to refer to the others to make sense of its own internal rules. For example, it is still fine to think of particles without referring to fields if you wish to describe certain simple mechanical interactions, such as the collision of two rigid spheres. None of these levels is exhaustive. All the levels are essential to understanding what is out there. Pausing there, just my quick reflection on this. So when it comes to a word like particles, I like to think that we just continue to understand the nature of a particle with ever more precision over time. And there'll be no end to how well we can understand particles. Take, for example, the electron. Now, it used to be thought that the electron, well, aside from the fact it, it used to be thought the electron didn't exist, that there were just these things called atoms and they were just spheres that were just indivisible spheres. We can go back to Democritus in ancient Greece for that. It took some time later until we thought that, well, the electron is actually this charged particle that orbits the nucleus in an atom. The atom now being something that is indeed divisible, made up of other simpler components. And then we realise, well, the electron might be the excitation of the field. But it didn't change the fact the electron's an electron. And I don't think it changed the fact that a particle is a particle. Unless one is to insist that a particle must mean something other than excitation of the field. In the same way that we do not need to agree with the ancient Greeks, Democritus doesn't get to claim the word atom and keep it for all time. We can refine our understanding of the word atom over time and come to have a better, deeper understanding of what an atom genuinely is. It's not something that's indivisible, even if the Greek word means indivisible. So too with an electron. And now we know an electron, excitation of the field, but also consisting of lots of fungible instances of itself throughout the multiverse, we should expect that this understanding of the electron will just continue to be refined. Could it ever be the case that we would find an explanation where the electron was entirely able to be done away with? I doubt it, but it's possible. It's possible. Are we wrong about the electron right now? I would certainly expect that to be the case, that we can find out something new about the electron, namely some new properties that we didn't know about before. All of these things are true, but I emphasize that because Certainly in episodes that I've done on the multiverse, I've said categorically that the electron is not a wave in a single universe, that I uh, refuse to go down the path of saying an electron is both a particle and a wave. I say it's a particle. Then, of course, we get into this idea that it's an excitation of the field, the field being a continuous thing across a universe. Does that then mean that the electron is a particle and a wave? Only if, I would suggest, only if you take into account a God's eye view of the entire multiverse. Seen across the entire multiverse, the electron might seem to be a continuous thing of a kind. And at the same time, in any given universe, it is going to be a discrete thing as well. I think uh, we need to be precise about what 
level of explanation we're talking about within the single, approximately single universe or across the entire multiverse. Anyways, that is just to <laughs> give my little opinion that electrons are particles, but we can come to understand what the word particle means to a deeper, more refined way over time. Back to the book. Pierre writes, quote, The usual output of knowledge creation in physics is a piece of knowledge that addresses a particular problem. For example, the explanation for why the sky appears dark at night, the explanation for why the sun appears to move in the sky from east to west every day, and so on. From time to time, such problem solving leads to an entirely new physical theory, such as Newtonian mechanics, general relativity, or quantum theory. These rare events have momentous consequences, resulting in a radical change in the way we look at the world, which may take several decades to be assimilated. Often, a new physical theory's practical and theoretical implications can be worked out only after a long while. For example, nothing in Einstein's theory of general relativity even hinted at GPS, the global positioning system, which provides information about location and time to our phones and cars using a network of satellites orbiting Earth. Yet GPS relies directly on the phenomena described by general relativity. The possibility of GPS is a counterfactual allowed by general relativity. That's why a new physical theory is much more than a solution to a particular problem. It is a conjectured explanation that attempts to approximate the actual laws of physics, the rules that constrain everything in our universe. If you asked a physicist to write down what we currently know about the laws of physics, they would probably start writing a bunch of equations. For example, E equals MC squared. But then they would think again. They would start adding words to explain what those various symbols mean. E is energy, M is mass, C is the speed of light, and so on. And they would explain in words what energy, mass, speed, and light are. All those words constitute the explanation that is the core content of the physical theory that those equations express. The two ingredients are indissoluble. Without explanations, an equation is empty and has no meaning. Without formulae, the explanation is too vague to be applied. A physical theory, therefore, is not just the set of its formulae, such as E equals MC squared, nor is it the collection of its testable predictions. It is a conjectured explanation, which includes, for example, the informal descriptions of what E, M, and C are in that formula, and why they are related in that way. This will also apply to things that, unlike the speed of light, cannot be directly measured, such as the geometry space-time, which are nevertheless crucial to explain why that formula, which is then relevant to make predictions, is as it is. In practice, physical theories about the universe that count as viable explanations must at least have certain traits that guarantee they are free of basic flaws. Just um, pausing there, my reflection. So here, the idea that the you know a theory is just a solution to a problem or a solution to a particular problem, it reeks of the instrumentalist idea that so long as you have equations, then what you can do is predict the outcome of experiments. This is what's being hinted at here. But in fact, if you're not an instrumentalist, if you are a realist, then what you say is that the theories we have are approximations to what is really out there in some sense. And in the case of physics, the conjectured explanations we have are approximations to the ultimate laws of physics that are definitely there governing the universe in some way. Now, if you're an instrumentalist again, then what you would say is, well, E equals MC squared just allows you to predict the outcome of, I don't know, a nuclear bomb explosion, how much energy you'll get. Without ever being, without ever worrying about, um, well, how do you how do you then even talk about energy? You then have to explain what energy is. A realist wants to explain what energy actually is. Would actually say, well, m means mass, and I'll tell you what mass is, and c means the speed of light, and I'll tell you what that means as well. You know that this this entire grand theory, the general and special theory of relativity, are actually describing stuff that's out there in the real world. It's not just to generate equations which then allow us to predict the outcome of an experiment. We need to have something more than that. We need to have contact with physical entities in the real world. That is how the explanation is cashed out. We need both, as Chiara says, we need both the formulae, the equations, because that gives us precision in being able to make some predictions. That's very, very crucially important. But we also need an explanation in words of what the different parts of the equation actually refer to.
And in that case, we have energy being referred to, mass being referred to, speed of light being referred to. Now we're about to get into uh, something a little new, a new little piece of terminology. And this is exciting for me because it's in epistemology and it's about the nature of an exact theory. So let's go to that. Chiara writes, quote, In practice, physical theories about the universe that count as viable explanations must at least have certain traits that guarantee they are free of basic flaws. In the first place, they must be exact. By exact theory, I do not mean expressible precisely in mathematical terms or anything like that. I mean a theory that does not include any limitation as to the accuracy of its statements. In short, one that does not include any approximation. Think of two recipes for a cake, one requiring that you put approximately 100 grams of sugar in a bowl, the other requiring that you put in exactly 100 grams of sugar. The first is an approximate recipe, in that 99 grams or 101 grams will probably do. The second is an exact one. Just as with recipes, approximations in physical theories are vague as to what they say about physical reality, and for that reason, they are problematic. For example, in regard to those recipes, one could ask why approximately 100 grams of sugar and not exactly 99. An example of an exact physical theory is Newtonian physics, which allows one to predict the exact place and time of an apple's landing on the ground once we know when and where it comes off the tree and its initial velocity. Newtonian physics is also an example of the most general kind of theory in that it is universal. A universal theory is one that is not subject to any limitation about its domain of applicability. Newton's theory applies to apples on Earth and on Mars and in any other alien place in the universe. Pausing there, my reflection. Let's do an example. Let's do this one. Let's figure out, uh, in, a, in a, a science book like this, I think it's recommended by editors or something like this, there's this saying that goes around for every equation that you put into a book like this, your number of readers is reduced by half or something like that. I don't know. Anyways, I don't care. <laughs> I'm making a YouTube or a, a podcast. And so I can, I can put equations here and I can do a little bit of baby level physics. So let's do that. Let's actually do the apple one. But before, before we get to the apple one, I'll do something even simpler. So let me put something up on the screen here. Here's an equation. Okay, so this equation here is V equals U plus AT. And let me explain what each of the parts here mean. This is one of the so-called SUVAT equations, S-U-V-A-T, which high school physics students are unfortunately forced to learn. Or, you know, if they're in higher enough years, they can elect to learn. The Suvat equations are part of Newtonian classical mechanics. They don't work universally, as it turns out. Now, they're purported to be universal, and Newton would have thought they were universal. But in fact, they don't apply because we have this thing called relativity, and there's an upper limit on how high V can be. V is your final velocity. V is your final velocity. U stands for your initial velocity. A stands for your acceleration, and T is the time over which you are accelerating. Now, where on earth did this come from? Well, on the one hand, you might think it's common sense, depending upon how mathematically minded you are. You might look at that and think, well, of course, my final velocity, V, is going to be how fast I'm now traveling U, plus how long I'm going to accelerate for. So that can be common sense. But in fact, it comes from here, the definition of what acceleration is. Acceleration is the change in the velocity over the change in time. So it's about the change in velocity. That's what acceleration is. It's how much you are speeding up, slowing down, changing your direction, that kind of thing. Now we can, that, that, that way of writing it there is A equals delta V over delta T. The delta is just the Greek letter, which means change in, some change in velocity over a change in time. Change in velocity is V take away U, your Final velocity, take away your initial velocity. And that's all over your delta T. How long, what duration of time you you happen to be accelerating for. So let's let's consider an example. Let, let's say that right now you're in a car and you're traveling at 10 meters per second. Now, I know that most people don't talk in terms of meters per second, but um, physicists, they like to talk in meters per second rather than miles per hour or kilometers per hour. We talk in meters per second. Let's So we're traveling at 10 meters per second. Let's assume that we depress the accelerator in our car and we accelerate at a rate of two meters per second. That's reasonable for a car. 
And we're going to accelerate. We're going to leave our foot on the accelerator at a constant rate of acceleration. That's the important thing as well. Many cars don't accelerate at a constant rate, but we're going to presume a constant rate. And we're going to do that for a time of five seconds. So we're going to put the accelerator down for five seconds. We're going to be moving at initially 10 meters a second and accelerating for two meters a second. Then how fast are we going at the end of this five seconds? Well, this is the maths that we do. We want to figure out what V is. So V is going to equal U plus AT. And knowing that U is 10, and I'm going to add to that 2 times 5. 2 times 5 is 10. So the acceleration over those 5 seconds has added another 10 meters a second to my initial velocity. So I've got 10 meters a second plus another 10 meters a second. Altogether, V, my final velocity, is 20 meters a second. So this is what we would call an example of a kind of dynamical law where we've got some initial conditions. My initial conditions were 10 meters a second, 2 meters per second per second was my acceleration, over a time period of 5 seconds. Putting all of those initial conditions together, I can then make a prediction of what my final velocity is going to be. So this is a way of conceiving of how physics is done. And almost all physics is little more than an example of this, hitherto, by the way, without constructor theory. So hitherto, we have equations, we plug in the initial conditions, and then we can predict whatever future state of the system that you want. So in this case, our very simple system of the car, presuming that relativity doesn't exist in the universe, presuming we live in a, 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 a universe governed by Newtonian physics, then I can tell you what your final velocity of v is going to be if only you can tell me what the initial conditions are, what u is, what a is, and what t is. So this is supposedly how physics is done. Give me a law of physics, like v equals u plus at. Tell me what the initial conditions are, and then I will tell you, I will predict any future state of the system at whatever time you like. Now let's have a look at Chiara's example there. An example of an exact physical theory, she says, is one, like Newtonian physics, which allows one to predict the exact place and time of an apple's landing on the ground once we know when and where it comes off the tree in its initial velocity. Okay, so in this case, I'll use a different equation. It's another one of these SUVAT equations. And if you're interested, then, then you can look up where you get an equation like this. It's a little bit more complicated than the previous one. But the equation is this, S equals UT plus half AT squared. And all those symbols mean exactly the same as what they did in the previous one with the addition of S. S is the displacement or where something is happening. So S is the displacement. U, just like before, is the initial speed of the object. T is the time taken. And A is the acceleration. Now, if we have an object like an apple sitting on a tree, then its initial speed is u, it's just sitting there. And what we're interested in is finding out s, how far it's going to fall. Now, if you tell me t, if you time, you're standing there with a stopwatch or something, next to the apple tree, timing how long it takes for that apple to hit the ground, then I will be able to tell you s, how far it has fallen, where it's going to hit the ground. Now, it's going to hit the ground, of course, immediately beneath the tree. But where exactly is the ground? Well, that's the problem that we can set out. So let's, let's make a guess. Let's presume that you're standing there with your stopwatch. And it takes precisely one second, one second for that apple to hit the ground. Then what do we predict for S? Well, S is going to be S equals UT plus half AT squared. But in this case, our U is zero. Now, u is zero, so that term u times t is going to also be zero, because it doesn't matter what t is, t in this case happens to be one, zero times anything is zero. So we've got s equals zero plus a half at squared. Now, what's a? Ah, a is the acceleration. Now, the acceleration in this case is the acceleration due to gravity, the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, which is taken as, roughly speaking, a constant all over the surface of the Earth. Let's presume we're at sea level, and the acceleration due to gravity there is approximately 9.81 meters per second squared. And by the way, this changes around the world just ever so slightly and can use the fact that it changes around the world to do something called gravity analysis. This is what geophysicists do, and you can find things in the ground, and that's a whole other area of science. But let's go back to this. S equals ut plus half at squared. We've got s equals zero plus a half times 9.81, now we know. 
plus a half times 9.81 times t squared times, how long did we say? 1 times 1 squared. So now we've got s equals 0 plus a half 9.81 times 1 squared, which is 1. So that's half of 9.81. Call it half of 10. So it's a little bit under 5. It's actually about 4.9. So the tree must have been 4.9 meters high. That's how far the apple fell. So 4.9. S equals 4.9. So we found out where the apple fell. So you can play around with that yourself if you've never seen anything like this before. That too is a kind, well, a that equation is derived from the laws of physics, the Newtonian laws of physics, as we presume the laws of physics would be if we lived in a universe governed by, for example, Newton's law of gravity. But now we know that we're not in that kind of universe. That, by the way, that, that works perfectly well. And the reason why Newtonian mechanics is still taught, still learned, is because for almost all engineering purposes, Newtonian physics works perfectly well. You can get to the moon with Newtonian physics like this. It is precise enough to be able to approximately get the right answer. And when I say approximately, I mean with high precision. Once you start to get to really high velocities, close to the speed of light, then the thing starts to break down. Then it doesn't work so well. Then you want to rely upon relativity, Einstein's relativity. But that is beyond the scope of even my podcast here. Okay, so just to summarize all of this, all I'm doing here is just showing you the traditional way in which physics has always been done. You have an explanation, a, a an explanation of how the world works in terms of forces, perhaps, things like quantities like acceleration and time, gravity, and so on. And from this explanation, a, a, a scientist, someone like Newton, is able to derive from certain principles, from certain things that he understands about reality, assumes about reality, guesses to be approximately correct about reality. He then is able to derive from that explanation certain equations which represent some aspect of those physical laws, V equals U plus AT, S equals UT plus half AT squared. And we can regard that S equals UT plus half AT squared, for example, or V equals U plus AT, as a dynamical law, certainly as an equation representing a dynamical law of some kind. And if we know the initial conditions, the numbers that we plug into the equation, we are able to make a prediction of what will happen in the future. This is the sense in which physics has always been done. And even if you get into relativity, it's the same idea. Okay, The equations change, but it's the same idea. If you get into quantum theory, it's the same idea. Things get more complicated in terms of the formalism, as we say. The, 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 the mathematical equations become more complicated. We have all sorts of weird and interesting calculus going on and matrices going on and, 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 and in certain cases, statistics happening. But it's the same. It, it is where we have an equation of some kind and we take some numbers that we know, the initial conditions, and we predict what is going to happen in the future. We're finding our V given our U, our A, and our T. It's basically that idea. Until now, back to the book, Chiara writes, Again, physical theories that are not universal and apply only to some scales or domains are by themselves problematic, because one still has to explain why they hold only at that scale and not elsewhere. So by tentatively solving problems in our understanding of physical reality, physics ends up seeking universal and exact physical theories. These theories, as I shall explain in chapter 2 and 7, must also be testable so that they can be checked against reality to find potential errors. Because of fallibilism, it is important to note here that exact does not at all mean true. Any conjectured explanation which seems to be working may be found to be false at any time. As I said, this happened with Newton's theory of gravitation when it was superseded by quantum gravity and general relativity. We can never know whether a physical theory that we have formulated is true. All we can say is that it has so far not been found to be false. This may seem a little unsettling, but it is an extremely interesting fact about how knowledge is created. And as I said, it is central to the possibility of making progress via criticism. Here, we get closer to the origin of the pernicious boundary to exclude counterfactuals. As one can imagine, there are different ways in which explanations can be formulated. How many? We do not know. Infinitely many, presumably. The mode of explanation of Newton's theory has a distinctive feature. Its scope is confined to explaining 
what happens in the universe given two primitive elements. One includes what in physics jargon are called laws of motion, the rules that tell us how the motion of systems, what physicists call the dynamics, unfolds in space and time. The other are the specific initial conditions of the motion. For example, Newton's laws of motion can be applied to say what happens to an apple given the initial conditions, the particular place where the apple started its motion and its initial velocity. The set of points that a system goes through as it moves is called a trajectory. Hit a tennis ball with a racket against a wall, the trajectory is the imaginary line one can draw to describe where the ball goes after it leaves your racket. The laws of motion and the initial condition give us a way to predict that trajectory without actually having to observe any actual ball being hit. Given the initial position and velocity of the ball, one can predict precisely where its motion will bring it, just computing the trajectory from the laws of motion. This mode of explaining things in terms of what happens has proved extremely successful and far-reaching. It allows for powerful predictions, which can be tested with experiments to enable conjecture and criticism. The mode continued to be successful even when Newton's theory was found to be inadequate by, for instance, failing to describe the precession of the planet Mercury. It delivered theories like quantum theory and general relativity, which are our current best theories to explain physical reality. Both of these subtle theories are formulated as laws of motion. It is the very same mode of explanation that Newton adopted in forming his laws. Along with much progress, this mode of explanation has, perversely, generated the wretched boundaries that could stand in the way of future successes. An unspoken stipulation was made, what I shall call the traditional conception of fundamental physics, that all fundamental physical theories must be formulated in terms of predictions about what happens in the universe given the initial, or more generally supplementary, conditions and laws of motion. In this conception, physics is no longer an open-ended enterprise. It has been infinitely narrowed to the project of finding theories that can be expressed only in terms of what happens in the universe given the laws of motion of all its constituents and a particular initial condition. So the ultimate theory about physical reality would consist of a collection of the trajectories of all elementary particles in the universe, given where and when they started. We do not have such a theory yet, but it is traditionally regarded, hypothetically, as the ultimate explanation of everything important about the universe. Pausing there, just my reflection. Okay, so in my very baby example of vehicles U plus AT, for example, you could apply this to... In theory, okay, if you're this oracle or a god or some sort of super intelligence, whatever you want to call it, that's got access to some kind of system where you know the current velocity of any particular particle throughout the entire universe, you know what its acceleration might be, which is a consequence of the forces that might be applied to it, then if you just pick some time t in the future, then you will know what v is going to be. Now, of course, there are lots of complications here, namely that you won't have a constant acceleration, let's say. Uh, putting aside the fact that, of course, the universe doesn't even obey v equals u plus at because we know that relativity and quantum theory, uh, for two examples, uh, contradict what is being said here. But in principle, you get the idea that if you accept the, the notion that there are these dynamical laws, that if you have the initial conditions, dynamical laws such as V equals U plus AT, then if you just plug in these initial conditions, you allow for the prediction at any point in the future, at any time T in the future, of the state that it evolves to. This is the concept of determinism. And so this leads to all sorts of poor philosophical arguments, I would suggest, as well as this narrowing of the conception of what physics could potentially be about. And it, it seems to, insofar as we regard this as being a universal truth about physical reality, it rules out all sorts of things. And this is why it leads to this poverty of philosophical explanations and other kind of explanations. We can't get beneath this notion of this kind of determinism. So we rule out things like free will, for example. Some people rule it, choose to rule out free will, and we're going to come to this um, at various points throughout the discussion of this book. It's a, it's a pet peeve of mine because free will, to me, apart from just describing what humans do, what people do, people make choices in the world, but it's also a label for a certain kind of mystery. And there is a mystery. There really are mysteries out there in the universe. There are so many things we don't know. We're at the beginning of infinity. But if you think that we already have everything wrapped up neatly, 
in terms of dynamical laws and initial conditions, which allows to predict at any any point in the future what's going to happen, then we have a deterministic universe that rules out all other possible mysteries in the universe. After all, isn't everything already predetermined? Therefore, there are no mysteries in the universe. There are no open questions. All we need to do is to plug into some supercomputer of the future or consult some oracle about what's going to happen, and that apparently solves everything. No, that merely predicts everything. And prediction is not the purpose of science or knowledge production in general. What we're after are explanations. And even if this conception of physics, this dynamical laws and initial conditions thing, was true, which we're about to say isn't the best way of conceiving of science, not the best way of conceiving of physics, let alone science, and I would say probably knowledge more broadly, even if we were to conceive of science being like this, it, it, it presumes far too much. It presumes everything can be explained in terms of physics. Well, it doesn't even explain it. It, it, it dismisses explanation. It says that everything's about prediction. And this is not the purpose of science. And it's an unfortunate thing that's entered the culture, the intellectual culture, one would say. That commented, people who commented on Newton thought that it revealed a clockwork universe and therefore ruled out every other interesting emergent aspect of reality. After all, if it's just a clockwork universe, then there's no place in it for mysteries like consciousness and free will, things that might not easily sit within this framework of determinism. Many of us say it does. It does anyway. Free will isn't at all affected by determinism. But anyway, what we're about to get to here, one reason I love constructor theory, is because all of this argument about determinism is predicated very much on the idea that it's true anyway, that dynamical laws and initial conditions are the whole truth of the matter, that there isn't a misconception lurking there, that there isn't a deeper way of understanding physics, and there is, and we're about to find out what it is. And besides that, besides that, and we're about to come to this presently, <laughs> the initial conditions dynamical laws thing doesn't explain why the initial conditions are the way that they are. Why are the initial conditions are the way that they are? Like, how, do we, how did we get to this state in the first place? And if you just say the Big Bang, well, why is the Big Bang the way that it is or was? There's no explanation. There's no way of even conceiving of that within the present framework. Nothing within that present framework of dynamical laws of initial conditions can explain why the initial conditions should be the way that they are. You can't refer to anything within that framework to give you the bits of the framework. Why are the physical laws the way that they are? Silent on that. These just are the physical laws. Why are the initial conditions the way that they are? Silent on that. That's just the way things are. Constructor theory is the first time, as far as I can tell, that we've got an area in physics which is going to provide a window into allowing us to peer into answers, possible answers, about that. Let's go back to the book where Kiara writes, That traditional conception has created the barriers against counterfactual explanations, and its project, if taken literally, appears impossible in the first place, it is not possible to explain literally everything in terms of initial conditions and laws of motion. For example, even if we had a decent theory of what the initial conditions of the universe are, it could not itself be explained in terms of initial conditions. For a start, it would have to contemplate what would happen if other initial conditions were chosen. A counterfactual explanation. How to explain the choice of the initial conditions is indeed an open problem in fundamental physics. There are also other related open issues that require that counterfactuals be addressed, such as the problem of fine-tuning the laws of physics, about why dynamical laws are as they are. For an excellent exposition of this problem, see Paul Davies' The Goldilocks Enigma. The fine-tuning problem cannot be addressed by stating only what happens. One has necessarily to look at what might have happened if the laws had been different. And how can one do that without counterfactuals? In addition, explaining what we see now in the universe around us in terms of a story that starts with initial conditions is itself arbitrary. One could describe everything that happens, including what we see now, given the final conditions of the universe, and then use the laws of motion backwards by retrodicting instead of predicting the current state of affairs. Pausing there, my reflection. Um, uh, yeah, this, this retrodicting versus predicting... Uh, very true. You know, given any state of motion, you can predict um, what 
the conditions are using dynamical laws at any point in the future or the past. M- many of us just choose the word predicting to as a general term. Even predicting what happened in the past <laughs> is still a form of prediction. You know that um, uh, predicting, for example, what the conditions at the Big Bang would like, uh, rather than saying uh, we retrodict what it was like at the Big Bang. We just predict, even though we're talking about the past. Now that aside. Um, Fine tuning. Yes, Paul Davies did write this excellent book, The Goldilocks Enigma. I, since then, there have been uh, other books. Uh, one one book was a fallacy, the Fallacy of Fine Tuning by Victor Stenger, who was a particle physicist, and he does very well to explain aspects of fine tuning. But then he dismisses them all and says that this is not a problem. That's a very interesting book. In response to that book, largely in response to that book, not only, but largely in response to that book. A couple of Aussie physicists, one is a theoretical physicist who moved into cosmology, his name's Garant Lewis, and another is an astrophysicist in cosmology as well, Luke Barnes. And they wrote a book called A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos. And that's a really interesting book because the two authors there are coming at the issue from very different positions. Garant Lewis is an atheist, Luke Barnes is not an atheist. I think he comes from a Christian tradition. And, you know, they both try and nut out the debate in a very friendly, good-natured, humorous way. And they explain all the modern problems. I think it's one of the more uh, very, very recent books written on this. 2016, it was published. You can get the audio book as well. Or just look up, uh, especially Luke Barnes, but also Garant Lewis, uh, on YouTube. There's just some really fascinating uh, lectures they give. Both of them have been on um, Closer to Truth, that wonderful um, series of interviews with uh, Robert Lawrence Kuhn. So you can find that find that here. And so I, I personally, I, I love, I'm fascinated by this fine-tuning issue, basically because uh, we know nothing. <laughs> we know so little. And in Lewis and Barnes, they don't push a particular perspective, even though I say, uh, you know, Barnes comes from this Christian tradition. He uses it as a way of critiquing uh, other ways of trying to explain or explain away the fine-tuning problem, namely via a megaverse. And Grant Lewis uh, uses uh, his arguments to try and explain away the supernatural explanation. So they're, they're using, they're very much in, uh, even though they wouldn't call themselves Papirians, I'm, I'm almost certain of that, I think they're Bayesians. That aside, um, they they use their ideas as very much as critiques of one another and ultimately come to the conclusion that, well, there are just many, many, many open questions when it comes to this whole area of fine-tuning and the physical constants. Much, much less to say, well, you could have different physical laws as well. Now, in the next part, we're going to bring this new theory of physics, which shows promise in providing new avenues within physics to answer age-old problems in physics with an appeal to epistemology. Let's go back to the book. Chiara writes, The traditional conception is also perverse because it clashes with the pillars of rational thinking, which I mentioned early on, that of being changeable and improvable via conjecture and criticism. Physics aims at solving problems, As a consequence, it seeks, if possible, universal and exact, testable laws formulated in whatever mode of explanation happens to be appropriate. In contrast, the traditional conception forces theories to come only in one form, thus narrowing down the space available for thinking. It introduces a boundary which impedes progress. It confines physics only to things that can be described exactly in terms of statements about what happens given the initial conditions and laws of motion, but not about other phenomena, which thus remain only imperfectly explained. There is more. The traditional conception of physics has inspired an approach that has now spread to other parts of science too, via an approach that has been called reductionism. The idea that there is only one level of explanation that is both fundamental and admissible, and everything else can be reduced to that. Such a level of explanation is, presumably, that of elementary particles or fields and their trajectories, given their initial conditions. But this take on physical reality is, again, too narrow. There are questions that this approach cannot answer, questions that are deep and important for understanding the the full reality of a physical phenomenon. For instance, the question, 
why is a given transistor in a computer on at the end of a given computation, has at least two answers. One is that it is on because the electrons in the computer were set in such and such initial conditions. The other is that it is on because the computer performed a computation to find the factors of, say, the number 15. And the on transistor is part of the encoding of the output, 3 and 5. A reductionist would discard the latter explanation as less fundamental because, after all, factoring a number is nothing but the electric currents in the computer. Reductionism ultimately denies that the computational description is necessary, though some reductionists may accept that it is helpful as a matter of discourse. But this is, of course, nonsense. Both explanations are necessary to understand what is happening. They refer to different autonomous levels of explanation which do not implicate one another. By ignoring one of them, one misses something crucial about reality. Reductionism impedes progress in physics and science in general because it requires all explanations to conform to certain arbitrarily predefined criteria. For instance, that they refer exclusively to microscopic particles and their trajectories. In the example I gave earlier about computations, the explanation in terms of microscopic particles and their initial conditions, i.e. electron currents in the computer, is not enough to capture the full picture of what is going on, i.e. factoring a given number. Yet reductionists insist on dismissing whatever does not fit into those criteria, from information and thermodynamics to creativity and consciousness as approximate, and thus outside the scope of science. The result is a narrow and limited view of science. Pausing there, my reflection. That might even undersell things. The result is a narrow and limited view of science. It completely dismisses the entire corpus of science aside from fundamental physics. It's everything else is utterly useless. Like there is no understanding there in, for example, evolution by natural selection. That if you want to explain the origin of species, the only legitimate true explanation that underlies everything is the equations of motion, the, the laws of physics and the initial conditions. That's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. That conception of science allows us to solve almost no problems. If we want to find a vaccine for the next virus, no one should be tempted to think what are the physical laws and initial conditions, even in the far distant future, because we have emergent simplicity. It won't be the most efficient way to figure out vaccines, even if we have a supercomputer of the future. We're going to want to understand the nature of viruses and how we can reduce their impact upon people over time. As for what makes science rich and interesting as well as useful, you know, these grand ideas about how cosmology plays out over time, we want to understand the evidence that's out there, you know, almost simultaneous with this episode, I released one on quasars. You know, even something within physics, even something within relatively fundamental physics, you know, cosmology, we want to understand the origin of an emergent physical phenomenon as well. And sometimes this requires more than just the trajectory of the elementary particles. Sometimes it requires the elementary particles, but sometimes it requires more than that, and the gathering of evidence that goes beyond merely what the fundamental particles are doing. Okay, going back to the book, because Chiara talks about precisely this, and she writes, There are phenomena that cannot be fully expressed by the traditional conception. By this I mean that physical theories and explanations about those phenomena can take only approximate, non-exact forms when expressed using the traditional conception's approach. So by restricting oneself to that approach, one cannot adequately explain them within science. One important example of things the traditional conception cannot adequately capture includes thermodynamic entities such as those associated to particular kinds of energy transfers. In physics, they are called work and heat. The laws stating how work can be turned into heat, and vice versa, are central to things like heat engines, which, which made possible the Industrial Revolution. Yet thermodynamics is often regarded as only a useful approximation, not a fundamental physical theory. So heat and work are regarded as not worthy of further explanation, because an exact physical theory about them cannot be cast in terms of statements about what happens given initial conditions and laws of motion. The traditional conception has thus given up on an exact understanding of work and heat and similar entities and claims to be content with the existing, problematic, approximate theories. These theories, as you will see, are highly effective, but only in certain limited domains. For example, to design heat engines such as those used in cars and locomotives. However, they appear to rely on various approximations which, when we consider these laws as fundamental, become inadequate. I shall explain these laws and how to solve them with counterfactuals in chapter 6. Just pausing there, my reflection. Um, 
there's lots of interesting books out there on thermodynamics if you're interested in pursuing this in greater detail. Anything by Peter Atkins is fantastic. Uh, I particularly enjoy this book, An Introduction to Thermodynamics, but he's also written very complicated books about this. It's a standard part of anyone's physics degree is to study thermodynamics. Uh, work and heat is uh, these are very interesting concepts, and I'm um, looking forward to going through that part of the book where Chiara explains in greater precision what work and heat really are. But I can give you the the general up until now physics idea of these um, concepts. Uh, work work is just a technical term for the product of the force and distance. So the if a force is applied over a particular distance in the direction that the force is applied, as long as the force and the, the distance are in the same direction, then you've got work. This is the product of these two things. If you're pushing something further, applying a force, then you're doing work in physics, okay? And so that, to some extent, that makes a certain amount of common sense. That's what work is. And so when you have a heat engine, then when you have um, a cylinder of some sort, then it's doing work because the, the, the gas is producing a force on the parts of the piston over some distance, and that's the amount of work that happens to be done. Now, heat, heat is a complicated process as well is a complicated concept and we can get right into it but Peter Atkins has this wonderful idea that heat is not the name of an entity so it's not a fluid of some kind he does, he says it's not anything of any kind it's the name of a process so it is where energy is being transferred from something that's hot to something that's cooler and so you're heating it this is causing something to heat up and so heat properly construed should be used as a verb but of course Chiara is going to sharpen uh, all these concepts up in light of constructor theory, but we'll get there in chapter six. And I'm going to skip a bit here where Chiara mentions what an, what emergence means, the, the, uh, this concept of emergent, where you uh, have something appearing in an explanation at a higher level beyond the laws of motion and initial conditions beyond basic particle physics. So once an entity starts to appear, for example, a cat is emergent. It's emerged out of the physical laws in some way, shape, or form. And and, and cats appear in explanations. Animals appear in explanations. They, they Genes appear in explanations as well. Um, the chemicals appear in explanations. These things become emergent phenomena. And all this emergent phenomena results in levels of explanation. So I'll just read a final part here about this idea of levels of explanation and privileging certain levels of explanation and that we shouldn't presume that emergent levels of explanation are any less important or even fundamental as compared to the ones about particle physics. Namely that the emergent things, the emergent concepts, objects that are out there, as Chiara says, quote, declaring those entities as not really of interest to fundamental physics. The problem with this take is that all levels of explanations are necessary to grasp a given situation. Remember the example with computation and factoring. Levels of explanation work together like layers in a cake. It is impossible to get the cake's full flavor by ignoring the top layers and just sticking to the base. In this book, you will be able to grasp the flavor of the full cake by being introduced to counterfactuals." End quote. Fantastic way to end today. So we're going to grasp the flavor of the full cake by this concept of counterfactuals. And it's, it's a wonderful way of conceiving of physics as no longer being about, as I said in the last episode, this single string that stretches throughout time. This string is very, very narrow. It's a single thread that is just an aspect of the greater whole of reality, the greater whole of reality being all the things that could have happened rather than just looking at what did happen and what will happen. Science should be about trying to figure out what could have happened and indeed what could happen if only we have the right knowledge. So it is a grand, broader vision of science, of physics, um, bringing together these strands in the fabric of reality, truly speaking, so that we can have a much, again, broader view of how to go about solving problems, generating explanations, especially in physics, but also in other areas of science. That's where we'll end it for today. Until next time, bye-bye.